Um, okay, so you had asked me to keep looking for strange mo contemporary topics, and until you give me a specific, I just keep looking. So I found one um, over the weekend. Um, I figured the, the best way for me to look was just to look at, like, you know, what other people have uh, spoken about. So I found another one by Rai Josh Flug, um, where he put together a sheer about the following question, which I thought was, uh, was, was interesting. Um, in response to the creation of, um, of uh, technology that focuses on designing um, computer brain interfaces that would allow the human brain to interact with computers, like Neuralink by Elon Musk, he wanted to deal with the theoretical question um, of what happens when we get to the point, if we get to the point, where we can integrate technology and the human mind so much that we can basically download information into our brain. Um, what does that do to the uh, mitzvah of Talmud Torah? What does that do to Talmud Torah if we no longer have, right, as it is, technology has made um, learning Torah significantly easier? Yeah. For sure, right? I think we'll talk about the questions we have to, to ask in a second. But let's just sort of frame it. But in general, right, technology has made the way in which we learn Torah um, completely different, right? It's made it much easier, right? You look in the medieval period, you'll find major baliatoso, who sometimes it's clear that they don't understand a sugya um, at all um, because they're trying to tease out the halachot based on the passage they have in one Gemara and they just don't realize it exists in another Gemara because they didn't have that Mesechet. Or they simply didn't have it. But you have this in like uh, the Mari Bruna's discussions of Lashon Hara. He tries to der derive all the, the halachic implications of Lashon Hara from a short um, parenthetical passage in Baba Batra even though the extensive discussion is found in Erechen. And it's clear that he just didn't have Erechen. He didn't know it existed. Um... Um, and in general, right, Talmuds, Tal, right, a volume of a Talmud was extremely expensive. You didn't necessarily have it. Nowadays, right, like, you know, last night I went online, and every few years they do this, like, major sale on the, uh, the Bar Ilan Responsor Project, that if you have any version of the Responsor Project from any time, right, most years they, they charge you by upgrade, right? So if you have, like, one from two or three times ago, Right? They'll charge you X amount for each one. They'll charge you more. At, you know, and if you're like three or four behind already, you just buy a new one. But every so, so often they do this sale where no matter what you have, they just upgrade you to the newest one for like one price for like 350 shekel. Um, so like, so I you know bought my upgrade to 28 plus. Right now, you know, presumably I have you know 95 percent of Torah at my fingertips on my little, you know, on my little flash drive, um, which is obviously much easier than anything's ever been. Um, you know, there, was a, there was an article a few, uh, a few weeks ago on the Lair House. Um, you know the Lair House? It's like an online, popularized, academic Jewish website. No. Anyways. Anyways. Um, so they had an article there by professors Maish Kapel and Avi Schmidman about the futures of, uh, of technology in, uh, in Talmud Torah. Um, you know, predictions that using artificial intelligence, they can basically, they think, you know, it's possible that they could create something like the Encyclopedia Talmudit um, without the Encyclopedia, without a person, right? Basically, the computer could predict all the relevant sources and compile them for you and, um, and different things. And then they focus on other things, vocalization and, um, you know, plus translation. And every, right? The nature of Talmud Torah has, has, radically, has radically changed. And there are implications to that halachically and hashkafically. Right? Halachically, um, for example, already most people attribute this to the Lecha Mishnah. It does appear in the Lecha Mishnah, but it appears earlier in the, uh, the Re Balatosot, quoted the Smach Miturich and Zemen Kofi Yur Aleph, um, that you know, there's a prohibition to paskin halacha in front of your Rebbe. But the... Um, Already in the time of the uh, the Baliatos, so they started saying, well, maybe that was before we had books, but now that we have books, the uh, the books are, are a and therefore... Don't pass in front of your 
well, you get both sides, right? One is maybe you're allowed to paskin in front of your, your personal human teacher because your primary source of knowledge was book knowledge. And the flip side, which comes up later in the acronym, which is, and it's irresponsible for anybody to paskin before you check the books because it's so easy just to access um, the books. So it, it de- democratizes information. It creates an expectation of, of, uh, of access or of, uh, of research that you know can't be expected. We don't have access to information, um, and there, like I said, there are many, many implications on halacha of uh, of technology um, on Torah. But um, but Ray Flug wanted to put together these sources on you know taking it to a much sort of as he said at the moment what is uh, science fiction, but. There's no particular assumption this will remain in science fiction. Um, at some point I saw a quote by some scientist, I don't remember who it was, right, that um, right, older generations took Star Trek as science fiction and we take it as an instruction manual, right, or, or something like that. Star Trek's not really my time either, but, but meaning all the things that were sci-fi, you know, 20 years ago are Reality. So who knows what will be true in twenty years? I remember. What, were you too young to know, remember, like the kids' movie Spy Kids? No, no, no. no. Okay, so you're like in the first one, the cutting edge technology that they had was was uh, phones that you could have a video conference on, right? That you could talk to people with Whoa. a video. This was like the cutting edge, and now it's like you know. Yeah, and another one was like really small camera. Yeah, exactly. Like all those things. Yeah, but also yeah. in a lot of ways, technology has developed in ways that we didn't think it was going to. Like if you looked at all of the '80s movies about this time period, they all thought we were going to have a flying cars revolution in energy. But we haven't had that. But we've had a revolution in innovation. Correct. So right. So there's been a lot of there's a lot of. Still get married. I'm still working on Um. So, so he wanted to deal with this futuristic question, right? Which is what happens if we can get to the point where we can download information directly into our brain? So, well, now, you're right that there's a difference between analysis and, and simply reading. But, um, but what does this do to Talmud Torah? And I think t- the questions we need to ask are, well, what exactly is the nature of the mitzvah of Talmud Torah such that this would change it? Right? Meaning... Part of the mitzvah of Talmud Torah is analysis, and then we'd have to figure out how this would affect analysis. Part of it is also knowing things, um, but we, you, you know, we might have to ask: Is knowing things a res- is this a result-oriented mitzvah? Right, like by the end of your life, you have to know everything, um, or is it a is it predicated on human effort? Right, like you have to be involved in Torah. Up to and in you know until the point when you cover all of Torah, but it's you know if you don't if, if you were trying your whole life but you never get there, then you're yotzei the mitzvah. But if you never tried and you just got to that result, could be down on your brain, you would not fulfill the mitzvah. Um, is there a benefit to it? Would we tell say you dafka should not do it because we value the effort? Right, that type of um, question um, is what you is what you have to ask. And and what I thought was interesting by the way you put it together is that. There is no obvious place that you look for this. What you need to do is sort of go back to first principles and say, what is the nature of the mitzvah of Talmud Torah? And then sort of work your way backwards and figure out how would this have implications on this type of technology. But obviously there's no siman and shulchan aruch of uh, if you could download Torah into your brain, um, what, would, what, what would that do? Um, but the sources that he that he brings are are re- relatively straightforward sources because re- the real sources are about the nature of Talmud Torah, right? We then have to tease out the implications for for this type of theoretical um, technology. So I thought it'd be an interesting uh, thought experiment to follow this through. So let's uh, let's take a few minutes to uh, to look at some of these sources, um, and uh, as you go through them. Think about it, right? What are the implications? Or even, you know, actually, before we look at the sources, what do you think, right? Before we look at the sources, let's take just a few minutes to uh, to brainstorm. What do you think? Should you should you not? Do you have to? Are you not allowed to? Right? Download it into your brain. Would you fulfill Talmud Torah? Would you not? Yeah. I feel like it's going to be like an even split between, like a total not look at between your 
obligated to, and it's also to type of thing. But what would it be based on? Um, the fact that, like, whether you believe that, like, knowledge is, like, the ultimate goal type of thing, or um, if, like, the acquisition and, like, the journey is more important in, like, Right, and I think that's fundamentally going to be the question that it comes down to, right? Is how much you think Talmud Torah is process-oriented and result-oriented, right? Um, and I think that's definitely sort of the meta question you have to ask to, to deal with it. Yeah? I don't think, I mean, from my standpoint now, I don't think the goal of the Nippur of Talmud Torah is to know something. I think the goal of the Nippur of Talmud Torah is to understand the process of understanding stuff, and therefore, even if you have all the information in the world, if you still want to understand everything, you have to ask a question, and then you have to uh, find all these random sources. Like, he could maybe... Okay, so, you, so you, you, let me just tease it out, because you're making two claims, right? One is the process matters. Yeah. The second is the... Well, one is... Right, there's two ways you could formulate this. One is the very act of engagement with the sources is what matters, rather than simply knowing them. The second is knowledge is not what matters, um, but but analysis matters, and you can't download analysis. Yeah. Right. Those are two different claims. Right. Because one is saying that it's the process itself which is important. The other is saying no, no, the result is important. It's just this is not going to give you the result. Those are two different claims. Right. Well, why can't they, they might both be true? I'm just saying they're both. I'm just saying those are two claims, not different. Yeah, yeah, not the they're process, different. They're I think both the process and the analysis are important. So I don't. I think that having all the information in your brain is fairly similar to like having Safari or the Barney Long project. Possibly. It's just easier to access. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it the same way that it's not like like. I, I see it as like having very easy access to sources. Like you could like I don't know, kind of like search a database of like whatever inside your brain, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily understand anything that you see there. Or even like say it's like I don't know, like a hard gemara, or even that you can like read what it says and understand it. Just because it's there doesn't mean that you know it. Right. Now, I, you know, I, I look, this is theoretical technology, so I don't know what it would mean, right? Is it that, like, you have a chip in your brain that you can then run a search, you just have to go to your computer, or is it that you do somehow, right, no. know it? I, I, I don't know. Again, this is all theoretical. We're talking a theoretical question. Yeah. Would there be a distinction between those two? Maybe. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, like, I agree with Ruthie, like, in the sense that, like, there is, like, more, there's like a process that needs to be learned in order to develop halacha. And there's like, like when we have all these classes, like, oh, you need to know, like, we're talking about like different ways of learning the text, which you would never get from downloading it into your brain because that's always changing and because there's different styles and there's different methodologies. Even if it was written out, like, you still wouldn't really get it until you did it. That's why you have like, People who like don't know, let's do it like on time. Like, because you, you go, you're not just looking at the sources, because you have the sources. You're going through this logic and you're learning how to, like, paskin alaka or like to do, make a drasha based on that process. And in order to develop alaka, in order to keep the Judaic canon moving, I guess you have to learn that. You're good. Okay, so let's take a few minutes and look at some of these sources. Um, and, uh, you know, try to get through the first few, I guess. Um, and then we'll come back and sort of talk about what we, what we think the implications are. I mean, we have some intuitions, but let's try to flesh them out in, uh, in sources. Um, okay, so um, as we've already highlighted, the, um, this, one of the central factors to answering this question is going to be examining how much of, uh, of Talmud Torah is about the process of learning and how much of it is about um, is about knowing the Torah. So, um, the starting point is, or at least one of the starting points, is the following Gemara in Menachot. The Gemara in Menachot um, tells us as follows. It's talking about, it starts in a completely different context, and it talks about um, how one replaces the Lechem Hapanim on the Shulchan. The bread on the shulchan is supposed to be there, tamid. And Rabbi Yossi said, what does tamid mean? 
He says, even if you take the old one off in the morning and put the new one in the evening, that doesn't violate the principle of tamid. When it says you have to have bread on the, the, uh, the shulchan tamid, that only means that you can't go a whole day, you can't go a night without having the, the bread there. Now, um, very quickly, what is the uh, what is the basis for his argument? Right, how could you say that the bread needs to be on the I get a carbon tamid? Right. Well, right now he's talking about the lechem apanim, but no, we'll come back to the carbon tamid in a second. Tamid. How could you say that it's tamid, but it doesn't need to be there all the time? Just like the carbana tamid. Yeah. So how could you say that? You're not bringing all the time. Yeah, okay, but that, that only <laughs> exacerbates the problem. So what does tamid mean? It means like regular. It's consistent. It's regular. Good, or as Rilukhul Sin once put it, it's very simple. It's, there are two understandings. If you want alliteration. Or sometimes tamid means constant, sometimes it means consistent. Right? So Rubiosi said... It means, by Lashem Abanim, consistent. Meaning, you can't go a day without it. But it doesn't have to be there all the time. Same as the Lashem, the, the Karban HaTamid, which clearly is once in the morning, once in the afternoon, but it's not all the time. It's not constant, it's just regular. It's consistent. So like expectation. What? So like an expectation that it's there. That it's there on a regular basis, right? So... I bring it always. What does always mean? Once a day. Right, but right. you would expect Cons- it to be there as opposed Meaning to consistent. it have to be like... Right. Meaning it, it follows a regular pattern, but it doesn't have to be there. Right. Tell me it can mean either. So Rabiosi says that it means consistent. And Amr of Ami, but then Ravami makes an implication. He says, Midvarav shal Rabiosi um, nilmod afil lo shana adam ela perek echad shachrei lo perek echad arvid ki yei mitzvah lo yamish sefer atara sefer atara azemi picha and he says what's true of the <coughs> what's true of the lechem is true of Talmud Torah namely Talmud Torah is a consistent not a constant obligation at its minimum right its minimum is consistent, and therefore you fulfill your obligation of not having the Torah abandoned from your mouth, I guess, um, as long as you learn a single chapter in the morning and a single chapter at night. And Amar of Yochanan, Mishim Rishim Bayochai, I feel lo karadam el kriyat shema shachrit varvit, kiim lo yamush. And then Rishim Bayochai said, even if what you learned in the morning and at night was saying shema, that would be enough. You would not violate the prohibition of having abandoned the Torah. The problem is that the Gemara in Brachot, Lamed Hay, records a dispute between Rabbi Shmuel and Rishon Bar Yochai as follows: Tanrabanan Vasafta Degonecha Matamud Lomar. You have to gather your grain, meaning you have to work. So Lefi Shenemar, why do you have to tell us that? Lefi Shenemar Lo Yimush Sefer HaTorah Zemi Picha Yachol Dvarim Kiktavan Talmud Lomar Vasafta Degonecha Hanheg Bahen Minach Der Eretz Sefer Rabbi Yishmael. She said, "Why do you have to say this? Because you might have thought I have to learn all the time. So if I have to learn all the time. When am I ever going to work? So the pasuk tells you, no, you have to work. From which you know that you have to learn at normal times, but you're allowed to work also. You balance your life." And Roshim Ba'echai Omer, Roshim Ba'echai says, No, Efshar Adam Choresh Bishad Charisha, Bezare Bishad Zriya, Bekotzer Bishad Ksira, Vidash Bishad Tisha, Bezare Bishad Haruach. If people are working, right, they're plowing at plowing season, planting and planting season, winnowing at winnowing season, etc. Torah Mateela, when are you ever going to learn Torah? So Allah, Bizman Shisrael, Zin Rizanosha Makom, if the Jews follow God's will, Malachla Naseda Yidei Acherim. So then their work will be done by others. And if they don't follow God, they have to work. Meaning it's a curse. So there seems to be, as many have pointed out, a contradiction because Rav Shurim Bayochai in Minachot says that you fulfill your obligation even by saying Shema in the morning and Shema in the evening. And yet in Brachot, 
he says that how often do you have to learn? All the time, always, and not work. Right, so which does he mean? So there are many different directions that can be taken here. Some say that you have to divide between obligation and aspiration. Right? I mean, the obligation to learn Torah is minimal. The aspiration is maximal. Um, and they're all different types of, of ways of formulating it. But one of the... Um, most sort of formal approaches is this by the Shulchan, Shulchan Arach Harav. Now, who's, who is the Shulchan Arach Harav? It's not the same person as Shulchan Arach. Shulchan Arach is Rebus of Cairo, right, in the writing in the 1500s. Shulchan Arach Harav, who's the Rav? In this case? What? No, not in this case. It's the first, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, right, the Balatanya, or Shner Zalman of Liadi. Um... And this is what he says. He says, there are two mitzvot, or two aspects to the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. If you look here, he notes the contradiction, and he says, um, uh, like five lines down. Right, how is it the Rishim Bayochai said you only have to read once in the evening, once in the night? Right, he can't be referring only to someone who already knows the whole Torah. Etc. Because not everyone knows the whole Torah already. Um, so he says, I'm skipping now, Now he introduces the following theory, that there are two mitzvot of Talmud Torah. One is, this is only part of the passage, but one is what he calls Yidiyara Torah, right, knowledge of the whole Torah, all of it, which in his footnote he thinks is, if I remember correctly, Tanakh, Mishnah, Tosefta, Bavli, Yerushalmi, Midrash, Halacha, which itself includes the Sifrei, Sifra, and the multiple Mechiltas. Midrash Agada, and I think in some versions, maybe Rambam and Shulchan Aruch as well, right? A nice short list. Um, but everyone is obligated to know Kola Torah Kula. And in addition, there's the mitzvah of Limud HaTorah. Right? Limud HaTorah. Now, he argues that when Roshim Yochai is talking about it's enough to learn a little bit in the morning and the evening, he means this, to fulfill Limud Torah. But there's also an obligation of Yediyata Torah. Now, in this piece, he suggests that someone who's incapable of knowing Kala Torah Kula, so then he focuses on Limud, and that's what Shem Baruch is saying. Someone who could know Kala Torah Kula, he has to learn all the time to make sure he knows all of it. If, you, if you're never going to reach that anyways, so then let's just focus on how much you have to learn um, right, how much you have to learn. Um, and that's what he and, he... and he thinks that's the the way you resolve the contradiction. Now, even if you don't think that resolves the contradiction, the point is, is he introduces these two mitzvot. Right? There's two aspects to the mitzvah of, uh, of Talmud Torah. Now, he uses this to explain as well why in um, the simple understanding of the Gemara, the, the Gemara in Moed Katan is that Talmud Torah does not... Well, most mitzvot have a rule, Ha'osek mitzvah patur mena mitzvah, Right, that if you're involved in one mitzvah, you don't have to do another. The, to- the Gemara says it's not true of Talmud Torah. Because um, that really wouldn't make sense, right? You would never, yeah, right, you would, right, you would never end up doing anything else. Um, but on the other hand, the Rambam rules that it's legitimate to push off when you get married to learn because ha'osik v'mitzvah patr min mitzvah v'kol shakein Talmud Torah. So he argues that it depends. 
If someone is on their path to learning all of the Torah, they're allowed to say, look, I'm going to be finished by the time I'm 25. I'll think about getting married after I know Kola Torah Kula. Right? That's legitimate. But to say, I'm never going to get married because I always want to be lear- learning, right? that's crazy because you constantly have to be learning. Right? There's, no, it's not like, there's not a quantifiable end. If you want to say, when I finish this quantifiable, very small little... Tiny, tiny. <laughs> well, you haven't finished this already. Right. It's, no. It's nothing. I think yeah. I wasn't allowed to learn it most of my life. So. None of it? Tanakh? Tanakh, that, and that's it. So. Yeah, I, I haven't crossed so many of this off my list, list yet. I mean, I've learned Tanakh, and I've learned the Bavli. And I'm, um, you know, probably no not so Sefta. You were showing me what I'm going through now so that I can check that off my list. Okay. It's like, I... Yeah, I, I saw it on Facebook. I was like, you, you know, Rav Yoni Rosenzweig and I had the same idea. And when Duff Yomi started again, we both started Yerushalmi on the same day. He posted it at some point. I don't, even, I don't think I've ever met him. But I was like, we don't teach at the same time, you know. Anyways. Um, what? But you work at the same school. He's a cool guy. You should talk to him. We've now been text, texting a little bit. I asked him to come speak at Migdal at some point. Yes, crossing worlds, you know. Totally. What does he teach here, brother? Gender and halakha and halakha Okay. You know, I really, I really should get around to meeting him because, like, I know he likes halakha methodology, which is, like, my minor obsession. So. Your doctorate? What? Your doctorate? Yes. You know, my, 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 my father was listening to this shir on Why You Torah, and he's like, what, you're starting a doctorate? You didn't tell me? I'm like, I didn't say that. I said, if, if, you know. Um, okay. So, so. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what would you say? Right? So now we've outlined two, two aspects to Talmud Torah. So what would you tell me? Based on this, the, if you could download the Torah into your brain, so what would you say? Would it help you for this? It would help you for Lima? Not at all. Right? We could... Talk about maybe, right, maybe it would help you with this, right? I mean, if I could download all the basic information in my head, maybe it would accomplish. Not necessarily. Like I said, maybe, right? I mean, it definitely doesn't help you here, where this is about the process. But we said that this might depend on process versus result. Leela is clearly process. I must learn every day, right? But wait, why isn't the idea Torah just the result, like knowing it? So, so Yidiyana Torah, potentially, Limud, no. Yeah. Right, so that's what I'm saying. So this, clearly, even if I knew Kola Torah Kula, even old-fashioned way, I was Rabbi Vadi Yosef, I just knew everything. Right, everything about everything, every, you know, at any time, anywhere. So then I still have to learn, right? You still have to learn. There may just be nothing left for you to know, right? Um, this definitely, this he definitely knew. Right, what else he knew, I don't know. But this he definitely knew. And, you know, a lot more. Um, I remember when uh, when his son came to speak, they like did like a memorial event in, in Gush at some point, and and Rav Yitzchak Yosef came to give like a shir in honor of his father, and he, he they took him on a tour of the of the library in Gush, um, which at the time had I think eighty thousand volumes. Now it probably has you know more than that. Um, this was a while ago, and he's like, I just saw your library. It was so nice, eighty thousand volumes. But I want you to know that when my father passed away, we counted his personal library, and I had half that. He had 40,000 volumes in his library, which he read all of them, (laughs) Um, which I know, like, you you know, people would go in, there'd be notes, and, like, Ray Bednar said he once went, and he found, like, random books published by Gush that were in his library, and he opened it up, and Ravadi had written notes already on the side, so, like, he had read, you know, so, like, he really did know everything. Um, I know, I I can't even, I, like, my, my brain just doesn't even... Com- How does compute. Have time for all of that? I don't know. I, I really, when you when you when you find out the secret, let me know. You know, and I speed read, and I still can't you know process it. Like, you know. I can't process stuff if I speed read. Oh no, my my students were testing me because I was like, oh, I speed read, and then they were like, oh, here's a test on speed reading, like these online speed reading tests, like you yeah. press start when you start reading and stop when you yeah. finish reading, and then you take a comprehension right. test, yeah. right, and like the top percentage or people who can read like a thousand words a minute and with 80 about 85 percent comprehension rate 
So they were trying to see if I, you know, got to that. If I really want to learn. Yes. Yes, I read about, yeah, according to the thing I read, like 1,100 words a minute with 80-something percent comprehension. And still I have, and still I have no, I, I cannot, I, I have no idea to fathom that. Yeah, I know it's just you know it's one of those speed reading is a skill that you you know you pick up. But still, even with speed reading, I don't know how you read that much and remember it. Well, go online; they have all types of ways of teaching yourself. Yeah, different things. I mean, the the number one way, which I've never actually done, at a Chabrusa who did this, is to train your brain to not read in your head while you're going through it. Right? What slows you down is that you are artificially read it, so like there are ways of training your brain not to do that. And then what? And then how do you hear the word? You don't. You don't. You don't. I don't know. I, I've never like, I've never, have, anyways. Not important. To really, um, um, okay. So potentially though, we have two aspects of Talmud Torah. One of the aspects clearly is isn't going to help you, the Limud. The question is about Yediyat Torah. Does it help you? So at some level you might say, uh, you know, well, I think you have to divide the question. One, is there a value? The second is, did you fulfill a mitzvah? So, uh, you know, I don't know. Is there a value to knowing Kala Presumably, right? Is it the mitzvah? I don't know. I think we need to now push it farther and say, well, what's the benefit? Even in, in knowing Torah and mastering Torah, um, uh, what is the value of putting in effort to get to that result? Right? Meaning the Shulchan Arab couldn't have imagined this particular eventuality. So if you look in the next piece, this is from um, Rabbi Shal Salanter. He writes, He also thinks there's a second aspect which is not knowing Torah. Now his source is the Gemara on number six. Um, no, sorry, number five. The, the Gemara says, Vishinantem. What does Vishinantem mean? Vishinantem levanecha. Literally it means it should be sharp. So he says, I'll take green. Um, vishinantem ela vishilashtem la ola mishalesh adam shmotav shlish b'mikra shlish b'mishna shlish b'talmud mi yada kamachai otichel yomei. So first of all, you have to divide up your Torah learning. Um, you have to divide up your Torah learning into thirds. Um, the Gemara has a bit of a deal of what that means. Um, there's a second line there. I'm actually surprised he didn't put this. The next line is uh, is really the key there. The Gemara then continues. Vishinantem shehu divrei Torah mechudad beficha that the Torah should be sharp in your mouth. Shem yishal halacha adam davar al tzarich ligamgeim el omer lo miad that if someone asks you the Torah, you don't have to stutter. You'll say it immediately, right? Which the Ran in Nidarim davchet understands as an obligation to know the Torah, right? To know the Torah. The Yatsev has a tshuva about this as well. Um, I remember once when I was in, uh, I think I, maybe I mentioned this to you, or I definitely mentioned to my students at Migdal, that I was, that Ruchensin once got very annoyed because people hadn't prepared enough for Shir. So he, he said, right? Katuv bagmara vishinantem shudivrei Torah mechudadim beficha shemishal chalchadam davar v'chulei, right? You have to know the Torah well enough that if someone asks you a question, you don't have to stutter. V'atem, atem afilu lo hitchaltem ligam game, right, yeah. right. You haven't even started to stutter, right? Right. You need to, uh, but there is this obligation to know it, to know it at the tip of your tongue. Um, so the Ori Israel writes this, and he says, and he quotes other ones. And he says, Yisora mitzvah azot kolal shnei pradim. Echad ha'idiyah l'archosh lo bikiyut b'chol chalkei Torah. Part of this is that you get bikiyut, just basic proficiency in all of Torah. Shiyu talmudo k'nege shagur b'fiv. And shtayim lo yecholet l'tchakem b'torah l'chadei d'aseichel. Etc. Um, the second is analysis, right? So he says there's two, even within... What you have to know, right, there are two things. One is knowledge, and the other is you have a mitzvah to analyze. And again, as several people mentioned, 
Maybe there would be a benefit to knowing all of the inf downloading the information. Maybe it would solve the problem of knowledge, but it would presumably not take away the secondary obligation to analyze and assess. Yeah. Good. So, so far what we've seen is according to all these sources, it would not be, maybe it would not be a fulfillment of the mitzvah of Yediyat HaTorah because you didn't do anything, but it wouldn't be a bad thing because it would leave you with the mitzvah of Talmud Torah and leave it with the mitzvah of analysis and it would just give you more information to work with. So what type of source would you have to look for if you thought that not only did this not maybe fulfill a mitzvah, which maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. There's no masa mitzvah, right? There's no formal performance, fine. But where would you have to look to see whether it was a good idea to, uh, to, uh, to do this? Well, what do you think? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, jump through the sources as you find them relevant. What do you think? What do you need... What type of source do you need to look for to answer that question? Right, because so far all we've done is isolate the different aspects. And so far, if I just had this, I would say, look, there clearly it clearly won't exempt you from learning because you still need to analyze, you still have a daily mitzvah to learn regardless of how much you know and how much you've analyzed. But so far, have we any, seen any sources which say it's a bad thing? No, it's just insufficient. Is there a reason why it might be something you'd want to avoid and not just something that is not enough to fulfill a mitzvah. What type of source would you have to look for? Um, Which would say what? Really what you should be doing is uh, not, I, I don't know. No, I, I know what you're saying, but let's, let's, let's right, what, what do you need? You, you need someone who's going to try and tell you the right way to live your life. To, that's going to tell you what? source is going to be trying to tell you the right way to live your life. I mean, what you're going to need is a source that's going to tell you that not just that there's a mitzvah to put in effort and learn, but that the only value comes from that which you get through effort, right? None of this, what we've seen so far, tells you that there's no value to just knowing things. It just tells you that's not enough. That's fine, yeah. Um, can't we compare, like, this technology that, like, you're uploading all the Torah to your brain to any other, um, like, sources or methods in Jewish learning that have made it easier to acquire Torah, or, like, new technology. So, like, the printing press, for example. Good. So that's what I said at the beginning, is that at one level, you could say this is just another step along the process of things that make it easier, like the printing press, like the right. internet, respon the, right, the responsive project. Or even, like, the Mishnah Torah. Like, it took yeah. these ideas that were hard for people to like five, and it compiled them so it was easy to read, so like everyone could have access to it. If anything, it democratizes Judaism. Good. So what type of so what type of source though would would weigh in on this question directly? Um, sources that are more traditional and that don't want you to change the way you're learning. Um, I don't know if it's more traditional, but what are they looking for? Sure. Right, sources that value what? Effort, thank you. That, that's, that's the word, right? You need a source that's going to say, without effort, this is not just not enough, but meaningless. Right, so where are you going to look for that? Right? Where do you even look? Now, you're right. Some of them are going to be most resources, but, okay, think. Are there any sources that you can think of that might be relevant? I'm telling you. Yeah, can you think of any? There's a, at least one very famous agotic passage that needs to be at least... Mentioned. It's agotic, but it needs to be mentioned. The one from the Mishnah? Not in the Mishnah. It's a Gemara. Oh. Oh, oh the angel that, like, put your yeah. finger in like, That the, right, the Gemara says that every person learns... Torah yeah, that's a Gemara. In, in, in utero. In utero. Yeah. Right, that the Malach teaches you all of the Torah in yeah. utero, and then you forget it. Yeah. Right? Uh, um... Well, yeah, that's why I did this, right? That's, you know, this, I don't know what, what this is, but, but I don't know where that came from. But the, but the Gemara does exist. By the way, it's not, it's not unique to Jews. Jews weren't the only people who believed this, right? The Greeks also believed this, right? Meaning Socrates talks about this. 
the um, right that all learning is really recalling. Do you think that um, that it's in the Talmud because they knew about the Greek ideal? I mean, I think. Look, there are different possibilities. Either this is a widely accepted view in the ancient world, and they all mean it literally, right? It could be. I tend not to think that. Um, I tend to think... Ray Salvechik used to talk about this one, and he said, as I've heard it, right, that the, the point of it was to, to emphasize... The point of the Agatha is not that you actually knew Kala Torah Kula, but as, mu- as much to emphasize the fact that Torah learning, you should view it as something natural, right? something that's already inherent. Um, I focus more personally on the difference between the Greek version and the Jewish version, because in the Jewish version, in the Greek version, um, all knowledge is innate, right, within the human being. In the Jewish version, all knowledge is divinely communicated. So even though the end result is both of them are forgotten, right, it has a, there's a different theology there of knowledge, right, which is, is knowledge contained within the human being or is all knowledge shared from the divine? My feeling is that the Jewish one is really a response to this belief in the ancient world that maybe human beings contain all knowledge and is saying even if you, even if you contain the infinite possibility for knowledge, right, it's because you're sharing divine knowledge and that's really the crux, that's my personal feeling on it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but at any rate, you have to bring that into, into conversation. Um, right, and, uh, you know, I'll tell a story, even though, you know, it's a story I've heard several times from Ray Brander um, about the Rav, though I know that some members of the Rav's family have heard the story enough times and they, they don't like hearing it um, <laughs> more. Um, not what? They're not here. They're not here? Um, but he said that when his oldest son was born, so one of the opinions for why you have a Shalom Zachar right, on Friday night after a baby boy is born is because, and the reason that you have uh, round foods there, right, that's one of the minagim, is to mourn the fact that the baby l- forgot his Torah. Mm-hmm. That's why we have chickpeas, right? That's the, where the minag comes, comes from. Yes, there's an old minag to have chickpeas at the Shalom Zafar. And one of the reasons given is because round foods are signs of mourning. And you're mourning the fact that the child has forgotten his Torah. And therefore you're coming and comforting him. Wait, and What? Yes. Yes, because there's no pe. Because there's no mouth. Right? And when you're in mourning, it's like you have nothing to say. That's the imagery. Um, yeah. Yes. Hold that thought. Hold that thought for. Okay. I'll tell. Hold that thought, and I'll tell you a story. Yeah, okay. okay. Anyways, Sir so Brander said when he got married, he asked the Rav for or the Rav was Masada Kedushin for him, and he asked him for advice um, or like last minute words of wisdom. And he apparent and as he said, he told him, "Don't have chickpeas at the Shalom Zachar." That was his advice, um, which um, Ray Brander said uh, he took as um, it's not something to mourn that you forgot the Torah because it's not something to celebrate to be given it given the Torah on a um, right on a silver platter. The effort is something that's worth celebrating um, and therefore it's not a bad thing to have forgotten the, the Talmud Torah. Right? That was that's the story he tells, which again emphasizes the notion of effort. So now ask your question and I'll answer with the story. Why isn't there one for girls? Oh good. Why isn't there one for girls? So um, I remember once that I was at a Shalom Zachar in Washington Heights with my wife when we, um, like, a few weeks before we moved to, uh, to Israel. Um, and when we came into the Shalom Zachar, so, uh, there were a few guys from YU having an argument about this. And they were, they were talking about the different reasons given for a Shalom Zachar. And um, and why it's not for a the minag didn't develop for for a girl, and um, at some point one of the people in the uh, in the conversation said, "Wait a second, what do girls do while they're in the womb?" Um, yes, this was an actual conversation. Um, Ora and I both basically had that look on our face. Okay. Um, so they start arguing about what exactly girls are doing in the womb, which is already when you're in, like, the realm of a god. Uh, anyways, at, after, like, a few minutes of this argument going on, 
um, Rabbi and Rebbe and Shechter walk into the Shalom Zachar. Oh. And they look at Rosh Shechter and they say, Oh, great, Rosh Shechter's here. We can ask Rosh Shechter. Rebbe, what do girls do in the womb? Oh, no. And he said, They learn Torah. And they said, But what do you mean? They're not obligated in Talmud Torah. And he said, What do you mean? Everyone agrees they have to learn Torah that's relevant to them. They're learning Torah. And they started giving him lundus, but maybe it's not a din Talmud Torah. It's a din in Hechsher Mitzvah. It's a Beis HaLevi. And he's like, but anyways, and Shechter's like, I don't understand. They have to learn Torah. They were learning Torah. So then they're like, but Rebbe, if women are learning Torah in the womb, then shouldn't you have a a Shalom but?" He stops for a second. He says, you're right. I think you should. And that was the end of the conversation. They were all like dumbstruck, at which point Ora and I decided that if we ever have a girl, which, you know, three boys in, right? Well, we'll, we'll see, right? We will do a Shalom Bat and say, well, this is not like some liberal thing. This is what Rosh Echter said. I heard it with my own two ears, right? He, he said that you should have one. Um, Rav Shechter is like, what, one of the things I love most about Rav Shechter is the fact that he is totally not afraid that like, if someone just, you know, if he comes up with a lumdus and it makes sense, that he'll just be like, oh yeah, that's what it should be. Oh, people don't do it? Okay, so they're wrong, right? Now, if you ask him a different time, he might say something else, but he will, he'll put his name behind um, a theoretical structure if it makes Sense. I, I, I cannot attest to the fact that he would do this Lamaisa. I just know that in this conversation, in that apartment in 142 Laurel Hill, right, this is what Roshechter said. Um, and, and that I intend on, on doing this to make a point. Um, yeah. Um, but why, why is part of their argument that, like, they're only learning I don't, what they're supposed to? That doesn't make Really? Sense. You're asking me a kasha on this? Really? Yes. I, 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 there was, wasn't like a sugya I found that I have to justify. This was like a conversation at Shalom Zachar in Washington Heights when I was 25. You know, 20, okay, whatever. I don't understand their point. Like, it was a very formal point. It was maybe it's, the Beis HaLevi says that maybe even within the Chi of Talmud Torah for women, it's defined as a part of the mitzvah. Right? It's a heksher mitzvah for the mitzvah they're going to do because of the Talmud Torah rather than as an independent standalone mitzvah of Talmud Torah. And they were Anyways, it's a very, it was a very lumdish argument, which, the point of that whole thing, right, was that, right, the sort of agotic traditions that have emerged around this, um, the tradition that says you mourn the loss of Torah seems to say that in an ideal world, there is a value to knowing everything, and losing that information, even if you got it with no effort, is something bad, and therefore presumably being gr- granted to you on a silver platter is a good thing, right? Again, maybe not a fulfillment of the mitzvah, but at least a uh, a good thing. On the other hand, this uh, this story from Ray Brender of <laughs> right the Rav's approach to that midrash, so to speak, w- typifies a uh, approach that says that we. Don't like that. We don't. We actively don't want to be granted things easily. The process is what makes even the knowledge so why do we valuable. Even in the first place? Well, that's why. So there are other reasons. There are much less we, sort of mystical, agotic reasons. There are reasons like um, it gives the woman an opportunity to say birchad gomel with a minion. Right, things like that, which in Yerushalayim, there are certain, Rosh Hashanah records that in certain places in Yerushalayim, that was the minag, right, that you said Hagomel then, even though most, um, there, are other, there are other reasons that are given, I mean, that's just one of many reasons, right, that are, that are given, it's one of those minhagim, who knows, right, look, for my, my oldest, my, my oldest son, I had a Shalom Zachar, right, for my second son, I didn't, because we were still in the hospital, um, so like, Shalom Zachar was like us and the you know, there were, like, three pe- couples in the hospital wing, and, like, one of our friends had come on Erev Shabbos and brought brownies. That was the Shalom Zachar, right? And, like, my third son, we had it, but it was crazy, because it was, it was Shabbos Hagadol, and, like, who wants everyone coming to their house with chametz? Like, it's a, you know... Um, it's a logistical nightmare. 
It is, especially when you're a rabbi in a community and you know people are going to show up, right? Like, so, whatever. Um, right, Jerk Chiner is a tzaddik, and he, he hosted it at his house, which, uh, um, okay. So let's skip for a moment, since this is what we've been talking about, skip for a moment to 23. Right, this is the Gemara that I was mentioning. Umilamdin oto et kolato rakulash ne'amar v'yoreni v'yomer li um... Nitmoch dvarai lekach shamor mitzvotai v'chiyai v'omer v'sod Eloah. Yeah, this wow! It is this printer is unbelievable. Um, yeah, it's not the font size. Unbelievably amazing. Um, anyway, so he learns kol Torah there. V'kevan shabal avir alam ba malach v'satro al piv umishach of kol Torah kula. And then when he's about to be born, the tar- the malach hits him on the face, right? It, this particular, meaning the fact that the Malach hits you in the face and you forget it, that's in this Agarata, right? The fact that, like, this thing comes because of that, that's not in the Agarata, um, and he forgets it. Slap. What? Really hard slap. Yes, yes, amnesia, for the rest of your life. Oh, great. Um, and we've already sort of mentioned the two approaches you could take on this, but if you look at the the next source... Um, look, look at the next two sources. One is by the Gra, and one is about the Gra. Um, so the Gra writes in his parish on Mishle, Nefesh Amel, Im Lamata Dara Be Al Tachzik Tova Las Mechaki El Kachno Tzarta. If you've learned a lot of Torah, don't, um, right, be haughty because of it, right? Don't feel proud. Um, for that's what you were created. And that's why, right, when you learn all of the Torah um, in utero, that's what it means, right? Like, you were created to do this, because you already did it. Um, so right, the point of this statement um, is basically to tell you that it's easier to remember that or to find that which you once had. Right? So that's why the Gemara describes Torah as a mitziah, something you find. Right? Because the main point of it, or at least the second point here, which basically says there are two purposes to this. One is that your actions need to exceed what you've learned. Right? And since you've learned Kala Tarakula, right, that sets the by really hard what you're supposed to do. Right? The, so, uh, uh, let's start again. The Gra basically cl- clearly understand this agatically. Right? And he says the point, what it's teaching you is two points. One is that since you always demand of yourself more action than what you've learned, if in theory you've learned everything, that means that the, right, the sky's the limit of what you, your responsibilities are in this world, because you are potential, in potential you've learned everything. The other is that it makes it easier to learn, because you believe that basically it's inside of you. Right? This, which is the same point Plato, Plato, Socrates makes about the theory of recollection. Right? That it's easier to learn, because fundamentally it's recollection. Um, now the Gra's brother wrote this next day for Malata Torah, which is very hard to read. So let me say it outside. Um, and he expands on this, and he says that it teaches you something else. One is that each person has a unique portion in Torah, right? I Meaning it's not just to remind you that you can learn, but to remind you that you that each person learned Torah, they each have something to contribute. Um, and the reason that actions is so important is because you learned in utero and you weren't able to mimikayim anything. Now, a, uh, in number 26, and this is a uh, relatively well-known, though if very odd, source, um, Reb Chaim Balazhin wrote a sefer called the Safra Ditsanusa. And in the Hakdama, and don't ask me to explain what I'm about to say, he says that many times, okay, a little bit of background. There is a book, I think we mentioned this last week or two weeks ago, Rabbi Yosef Karo, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, what other books did he write? 
Beit Yosef, which is an encyclopedia on the tour. What else? Kesemishin, which is his commentary on the Rambam. Good. What's his weirdest book? Uh, By uh, uh, the Magid Meisharim. What's the Magid Meisharim? Correct. It's it's his is his chavrusa with his his personal malach, the Magid. Right, the Magid likes him a lot. Right, the Magid in the Hakdama says that he asked God, "What do you think about Rabbi Yosef Karo?" And he says, "Yosef Hamichune Karo, Pasak Naraba Dara de Israel." Right, the great postek of Israel, Mechabar Naraba. Dara the Israel, or the great author, and goes on. Hasher Melech Malchei Hamlachim Chafetz Bikaro, right, right, which is taken from the Megillah, right. Hasher Melech, but Melech Malchei Hamlachim Chafetz Bikaro. It's an interesting book. Reb Chaim Velazhin said that apparently the Gra was once offered, or many times offered, Chavruzas with Malachim. Don't ask me what this means. I don't know. <laughs> and what did he, the Gra say? No. Nah, Exactly. That is exactly what he said. He said, no, I don't want it. Why didn't he want it? Because he said, they wanted to be You want to give me the secrets of Torah without effort? He refused to listen to them. One of the angels really pressured the Gra to let him teach him everything. Um, he refused to look at him because he said the mitzvah of Talmud Torah is to learn it yourself. So these types of sources, right? these types of sources, what do they emphasize? Not just that there are two aspects to Talmud Torah, but that even this aspect, Yidiyata Torah, might, right, might not be valuable unless you got it through effort. If that's the case, it's sort of this weird mystical story of the Gra, right, you would say that there is a obligation to avoid any version um, of this. Now, why would you say that this is different from, let's say, the printing press or things like that? Because the printing press is just copying it down. Your yeah, mind. meaning it's one thing to make things easier. It's another thing to remove all effort. Right? You, there's no chiyuv to struggle, even though there is a, a tshuva and leket yosher, who's a Talmud of the Tshuva Dadashen, who actually who, who says that in his Beit Midrash, they once wanted to introduce new technology. They wanted to introduce a swivel table so that when they needed a book from the other side, they could just... Why don't I just get up and go get the book? So that's what the Lekid Yosher said. He said, no, I don't want you to make it easier. Right? You have to work for Talmud Torah. Swiveling. I, I have not seen this inside. I haven't seen this inside. I heard this in a shir by Ray Rosner yesterday. I was listening to Dafyomi yesterday in the car. So I meant to look it up, but it's in my head. So I have to look up this Juvah and Lekid Yosher. Um, but again, that's part of sort of a group of, uh, of halachic, hashkafic think, thoughts that point in the direction that maybe Talmud Torah fundamentally requires effort, maybe even extra effort. Right? I mean, you can't make things easier. That, I think, is a bit radical. Right? I don't think we should accept that it's problematic. I mean, what? I, I'm not allowed to use Barilan. I have to go down to the National Library to find... You know, a physical copy of this bizarre tshuva from the 1750s, right? I can just pull it up and read it. Then I'll struggle over understanding it, Are you right? not allowed to ask a post like a question? Do you have to, like, learn the entire circuit of yourself and decide for yourself? Like... No, I, 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 would, I would definitely be okay with saying, well, not that you shouldn't ask a post, but I'd be totally fine with saying yes. As much as you can, every sugya, go into a question knowledgeable. Well, I'm okay with that. that. I'll, I'll put... practicable for the vast majority of people. Oh, for sure. But the more effort you can put in, the better. Um, yeah, but you're right. You just put infinite, like... You're right. I, so I don't... I, you know, I have to look at this like at Yosher inside. My feeling is that we should distinguish between effort of access and then the effort of the actual process of learning. I mean, there's nothing wrong with making it easier to access a book. Like, I know certain people, and I don't understand this, they only want to read the old versions of books that are, like, in small Rashi script and the pages are yellowing oh, like because... This. Yeah, like that. 
instead of like the one in big font with block ones with footnotes because it feels more authentic. I don't buy that, right? I think why shouldn't I make it easier to access the text, the effort? Because then you can use all the effort you have on the actual text. on the actual understanding of the text. So I, I I don't know what I would say for this chuva in the in the Leket Yosher, but um. All of our worksheets still have the original text from the books. What? So, yeah. yeah. So. Um. So, based on sources like this, um, you would say that, in fact, there is a, uh, a problem with making it too easy to access the information, right? Or taking all effort out. Um, and if you look at 27 as well, he says, Vanir bazal pi, vanir bazal nidash, mlam de kolotar kulo adam bizman shuhu ubar. Right? He comments on this midrash that you learn the whole Torah when you're in. Utero. Um, he says, what was the point? The, he said, he thinks that the point we just made is in fact the point of the Agatha. Right? He says, the point, you want to know the point of the, like the meaning of this Agatha? The meaning of the Agadah is not the fact that you learned it. It's the fact that you forgot it. Right? Meaning, until now, we've been saying the meaning is that you remembered it. But he's saying, no, no, no. The point was that you, uh, the Agadah that was coming to tell you that if you could get to the point where you knew Kala Torah Kula, but it didn't take any effort, that would be a problem. And we would want you to forget it because we want the Torah that you know to be through, um, through effort. He gets on to af- afterwards the different ways in which people acquire Torah. If you're Talmidei Chacham by learning it, if you are not someone who's a Talmud Chacham, maybe by supporting Torah. Um, but that's not our uh, our issue for now. So, so far, what we've seen there for is that one, there are two aspects: the mitzvah of Torah, learning and knowledge. In theory, you could have said, "Look, you're never going to be able to replace the value of learning. That's process oriented by definition, right? By definition." But this other aspect of knowledge of Torah, so that you could go two ways, right? One is to say, there's no problem. As long as you're going to take this body of knowledge and learn it, so then it's fine. Right? The other would, to, would be to say that no, these actually have to influence each other. Meaning, the fact that part of the mitzvah of Torah's process teaches you that even the aspect which seems result-oriented must be achieved via... A process. And again, my feeling would be to the extent that, that that value exists, that value exists in terms of knowing um, effort put in understanding the Torah itself, not things that make it hard, right? Like small texts and, and swivel tables, right? Like I, I, I can't imagine that that's actually a, a problem. If um, it is, that's an issue. What? If it is, that's an issue. Yeah, I mean, responsive project would be like, terrible, or the internet, or, you know, why you Torah, or anything, right? You know, it's terrible that you can listen to Torah while you're driving. You should have to go to the Shear, right, and, and sit in traffic for hours to get there. I mean... Yes, you should walk. That's right. You should walk to all, all Shirim. Not everything, but, like, you should... If the book is on the other side of the table, yes, you can get up and move. Okay, yeah, of course you can. You can make quantitative distinctions if you want. Yeah, I need to find this in uh, inside again. I, I only like I heard it for the first time. Um, I remember, anyways, last night, um, and I was like, "Oh, that's interesting and a little bit, little bit strange." Um, Okay, I mentioned some of the sources already on, um, let's see, how much time do we have? We have a few minutes. Um, okay, you know, once we're talking about it, so it's just worth throwing out some of the, the issues uh, here. Um, right now, in what way should one learn, right, once we're talking about it? So as we already saw, the Gemara in said you should divide up your Torah into thirds. Um, so what does that mean? So halacha 
Um, the Baliyat Tosvot, based on Rabbeinu Tam, think that means basically you can learn Gemara all day, because Gemara has Sukkim in it, and it mixes everything together. Uh, the Rambam thinks what it means is that at the beginning of your learning, you divide it equally between Tanakh. Um, um, a third in, in the text of Mishnah, essentially, which means Sar Shabal Peh, but just the simple ideas, and then a third in analysis. And then, as you get older, and you cover more information, so you devote more and more time to analysis, because you already know the basics, and you set aside periodic times to review the basics, but use most of your time in Talmud Torah on analysis, right? And therefore, um, sort of this distinction between acquisition of knowledge and analysis, which was one of the other distinctions we talked about, the Rambam basically says it depends on what stage of your learning. Obviously, the earlier stages of learning, when there's still work to be done in terms of accessing and uh, information, so you focus more on, on learning information. And analysis becomes more important um, as, you, um, as you go on. I'll skip the issue that I, I threw out um, before about Osek uh, B'mitzvah Patzer Min HaMitzvah and this distinction right, between saying that the, the knowledge that you know um, right, that aspect of the mitzvah is easier to say, look, you can push off until you know a basic core information. That's the Shulchan Aruch Rav's argument. Um, and therefore, it's legitimate for someone to, let's say, I'm going to get married later so that I have time to learn the basics. Um, but obviously, analysis is something that's a lifelong um, process, um, which is another part of, uh, of this. Um, A few other sources just on this value that we sort of, uh, we jumped to at the end of Amelut. So if you just look, I put, there's a few Agadic passages here. So look at, uh, at 13, um, where the, the Gemara says that the very purpose of Amar Abiyaz Chagbar Avdimei, Maikra Shneemar Nefesh Amel Amala Lo, um, what does that mean? So, uh, skipping down. So, Amar Abilazar called Adam Amal Nivra. The Gemara in, in, in this passage, Sanhedrin says that the purpose of human beings is to toil. I don't know what type of Amal does that mean I have to work? Does that mean my goal in life is what I say? So, the Pasuk says that it's Something to do with your mouth. The purpose of the world is to be involved in Torah. So, so these ideas that we talked about at the end, that I'm at a certain level, uh, without effort things aren't valuable, does seem to bear itself out in certain, again, more agotic statements um, that emphasize uh, effort. Um, and again, you get this Gemara in Megillah, on number 14, where even when explaining, describing Talmud Torah, the Gemara says, If someone says, I put in effort and didn't find the Torah, don't believe, don't believe him. If I didn't, but if he said, I didn't put any effort in, and yet I learned, don't believe him. Don't believe him. But if he said, I put in effort and I found, so believe him. Meaning, t- definitional to Talmud Torah, according to the Gemara, is you need to put an effort to get. If you got it without effort, or you put an effort and you didn't achieve it, don't believe them. Fundamental to it is uh, effort, and then a certain modicum of success, at least, is guaranteed. Um, and then, and he, the Gemara says that that's only by Hani Mili B'divrei Torah. Right? That's only by... Torah, but not by Maso Mata, not by business, where a lot of it is luck. Um, but the Gemara then says, but this is only in terms of learning. But he says, in terms of whether or not you remember your learning, that's a gift from heaven. Right? Memory is not something that is easily, it is improvable, but it's not easily Improved. So from this Gemara, on the one hand, you see that effort is very central. Um, 
you also see that at some level, the, the question whether you remember it, assuming you're trying, is less important than the fact that you did your best, which again emphasizes the, the centrality. Of, now, there are other Gemaras that indicate differently, because the Gemara in Menachot says that there is an Isser de Araisa, there's a biblical prohibition to forget Torah, um, you know, which, which complicates uh, matters a little bit. Um, Okay, so let's, let's summarize it and wrap it up here. Um, so basically what I think we, we've seen is that, is there a value to it? Again, this is more of a agadeg, halachic, somewhere in between sheer, but it was a bit futuristic, so you know, it fit the bill. Um, if I could download Kola Tarakula into my head, would there be a value? So as we said, clearly in terms of the mitzvah of Limud, you would still have a mitzvah to learn on a, on a regular basis. That isn't going to go away. Is it going to help you with this value of Yidiyata Torah? So, there's a few reasons why you might say no. One is that maybe central to Yidiyata Torah is also analysis. But then you could say, okay, fine, so it doesn't accomplish analysis. But if I can download all the, or upload all the information to my brain, um, and then spend the rest of my life with analysis, is that problematic? So on the one hand, you might have said no. Because, look, I'm still spending my time on Talmud Torah. This is no different than... You know, printing easy-to-read books and having the responsive project or using the internet. But on the other hand, the more you uh, give stock to these sources that say that, that without the effort put in, there is no value, the more you'll say, no, no, this is something that should be actively be avoided. Um, now, I think you could construct another possibility, which is to say that if I go through the process of learning everything myself, but I have a bad memory... And then I can sort of supplement my actually having read everything by uploading it into my brain. So maybe that would be okay because now you've put in the effort and as Rashi already said, whether or not you remember things is not usually up to you. But just like there's presumably no problem learning like memory tricks, if I actually went through with the effort and then I used this technology to bolster my learning instead of reviewing constantly... Right, once I've learned it, I then, you know, upload the file to my brain so that it's there permanently. Right, maybe you could sort of come up with a combined, uh, combined model in which it would be, uh, when, which we could uh, endorse it. I don't know, these are um, interesting thoughts to, uh, to think about. Okay, there's some more sources here, but I think those are the fundamental questions, which to be fair, in our conversation, even before we looked at the sources, we outlined all the general directions. These are just some sources that point in, uh, in the direction. Um, okay, I think we only...